Good morning. I'm John Friedman, and I'm based in Washington, D.C., where I lead government affairs and global partnerships for GE's water business. GE is one of the world's leading advanced water treatment technology companies. We have 50,000 customers in 130 countries. I don't see Ali Zaidi, but um, I had the honor on Tuesday of attending the White House Water Summit. Manu, I know you were there. Peter, Marianne, you were there as well, probably others. Um, one of the really interesting things I heard was from John Holdren, he's President Obama's Science and Technology Advisor, and he said, while numbers are almost never everything, they're almost always a great starting point. And Manu, I think in your opening remarks where you talked about the state of the nation's water challenges, you laid out some numbers that are very sobering. I'll just add to that that the American Society of Civil Engineers just released a report giving the country's water and wastewater infrastructure a grade of D minus. That is even worse than my grade in calculus two at the University of Virginia. <laughs> I still don't know why I took that class. I was a history major. <laughs> and we're losing seven billion gallons of water each and every day through that D minus infrastructure, even though we're experiencing droughts that are unprecedented in our history in places like California. But, I'll come back to John Holdren. He also said that while these challenges are great, they're also solvable. And this morning, we have a panel of four incredible experts who are going to tell us how we can go about solving these challenges through policy. And I'm going to start, I'll work from my left to the end. We'll start with uh, Brett Walton. Brett is a reporter for the Circle of Blue. Many of you probably know the Circle of Blue. It's a news agency that shines a light on water issues globally. Then we have Mary Ann Dickinson. Mary Ann is the CEO of the Alliance for Water Efficiency in Chicago. And Mary Ann uh, provides thought leadership and best practices around using water sustainably. Then we have Lynn Broadus, who runs the eponymously named Broadview Collaboration, Inc., which I believe works with pro nonprofit, government, NGO clients to help them develop natural resources strategy. And Lynn, you also worked for six years before that leading environmental programs at the Johnson Foundation's uh, uh, Wing Spread, Johnson Foundation at Wing Spread, and perhaps even more important, like me, Lynn is a graduate of the University of Virginia who plays tonight at 7 p.m. <laughs> against Iowa State. <laughs> which leads me to Peter Glick. Peter is a world famous water policy expert. Peter, I, I read about you before I even uh, became government affairs leader for GE's water business, uh, read many of your articles. I've seen you testify before Congress. And like most Yale grads, Peter probably doesn't even know that Yale has a basketball team, <laughs> but they beat Baylor in the NCAA tournament before losing a close game, Michael Dean to Duke. So that brings us to uh, our panel discussion. I'd like each of our panelists to take one to two minutes and just tell you a little bit more about themselves so that you really have some context for the remarks when we start asking them questions. And Brett, let's start with you. Thanks, John. Uh, so it's good to be here at Circle of Blue. You may or may not have read us on the internet. We're a, a news agency, nonprofit news agency that reports on water. And we view water as the lens to, to see the world uh, through all these connected challenges of energy, agriculture, food production, um, health, economic, social well-being, all of this. Uh, we find water and the related challenges one of the most compelling stories of our time. Uh, we're telling this story in the United States, in China, in India, in Australia, Mexico, now South Africa. Um, so what we see is that systems that we built decades ago are no longer suitable for today's environmental and social conditions. We have a changing climate, we have changing demand patterns. Uh, so the story is twofold. One, do policymakers, does society recognize that change? And two, how do they respond to it? So the story we tell, one, is pointing out the changes, and two, uh, taking a look at what the response is. Is it sufficient? Where are the gaps? Where do we need to see more action? Uh, so I'm glad to be on a, a panel about communication of these challenges because it is a big 
a big problem. Uh, there's a lot of big words and concepts that need translation to both the public to advocate for change and to policymakers to understand what the best changes could be. Thanks, Brett. Marianne? Hello, everyone. <clears throat> um, I represent the Alliance for Water Efficiency, which is a nonprofit organization formed in 2007 to promote the efficient and sustainable use of water in the United States and Canada. And you might wonder why we were only formed in 2007, uh, when energy efficiency organizations very similar to ours have been in existence for 30 years. We kind of wondered the same thing. There were a number of us who were working in the field of water conservation and efficiency and realized there was no national platform for any kind of advocacy on efficiency issues. And so we created an organization to do just that, to provide um, not only technical assistance to water utilities and other water-using stakeholders about what the best practices were in water efficiency, what the most cost-effective options were, but also to do research on what the next leading edge should be and to provide guidance to state and federal legislators and policymakers about needed policies that would promote efficient solutions. So that's why I'm particularly pleased to be invited to be part of this panel where we'll talk about what our ideas are for policy barriers. Um, and I will just conclude by apologizing for my voice. I've been sick this week. So if I start having a coughing fit while I talk, please forgive me. Thanks, Mary Ann. Lynn? Um, Mary Ann's comment, there's a great lead into, just, you know, it, it's often said that all water is local and we need some. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I think this will go better that way. Um, yeah, I, uh, I am president of a little company that I started last year, Broadview Collaborative, which is, uh, works primarily with nonprofit and foundation clients, but also with um, water uh, innovation startup companies. So some of the small innovators that are looking to break into and, and change some of the ways that we do that we do water and um, uh, you know I think of the um, when, when I started at the prior to uh, starting my own company as John was saying I was with the Johnson Foundation at wing spread which is an unusual foundation in that we don't we didn't give grants we brought people together for dialogue and I was charged with starting to lead a national conversation around water bringing together different sectors and uh, one of the first big kind of consensus reports that we put out was in 2010 uh, charting new water as a call to, to action for national water something policy um, but you know, what was really interesting, especially from a 2016 perspective, is when we were shopping that around with um, federal agencies, with local groups, with states, whatever, a lot of the response was, what's the big deal about water? Why are you so worried about water? Um, and I will say that included you know, having a hard time getting traction with the US Department of Energy at the time. Um, I am very happy to say that for all the wrong reasons, that sentiment has changed. Um, and you know, it, in it, you know, first Texas was having a drought, but people kind of viewed Texas as another country. That's their problem. But then the California drought happened, and that was a really big deal. That very much caught people's attention around water quantity issues. Um, you know, Des Moines having to uh, uh, make a statement and, and um, take uh, take on a lawsuit to push upstream on their water quality problems coming off of agricultural lands. That didn't get much, that's getting traction locally, but it's not, hasn't really been a national story like it should be. Failing septic in our, um, some of our rural areas and the horrible human uh, story that comes along with that, you know, despite Brett's best efforts, is still not really getting national attention and national traction. When um, uh, Charleston, West Virginia experienced shut off of its water because of a chemical spill that probably was very preventable, um, uh, the, uh, that got a blip of national attention but didn't bring about any national changes. Uh, cut, water cutoffs in Detroit, again, is sort of their problem. Not until this Flint situation have we really, I hope that this is finally what is going to get our national consciousness wrapped around water. Um, uh, and, and then I think that we will have plenty of chances to, to talk about what that may or may not bring about, some of the, the good and the bad that comes from that. Um, you know, I also say that I think that one of the things that we will be addressing today is, you know, who needs to be at the table in these sort of multi-partnership things? And it strikes me that the, thank you very much, it strikes me that um, in my sort of pro bono part of my life, 
I, I actually have a foot in most of the camps that need to be at the table. Um, I, uh, I'm on a board along with Marianne Dickinson of River Network, which I uh, chair that board, and it's a, it represents more than 500 watershed organizations, the citizen advocates, the private citizen and the local voice um, and the, the uh, citizen advocate that is such a critical part of the work that needs to happen around water. Um, I also chair the board of the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at University of Wisconsin-Madison. There's the academic role, the very important academic role that drives a lot of the innovation that we see that is that then can get commercialized. That's a really important voice. And then um, I also am on the board of the Water Environment Federation, which is really a utility organization, represents primarily wastewater utilities, but also stormwater and to a large extent, many of the, there's a lot of overlap with water supply. So the, the utility sector needs to be at the table. They're doing a lot, they need to do a lot more. And um, I think that that, that, that maybe that partnership gives me a slightly unique perspective into all those worlds and I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation and to not and, and to what uh, the role that Columbia can play in helping to drive this forward thank you thank you Lynn so Peter that brings us to you so good morning everyone uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, first of all thank you Manu and Columbia for hosting this uh, second there are a lot of people in the room I know, uh, known for a long time, some of whom I've seen twice in one week, which is really a remarkable thing. Sometimes I go months without seeing them, and, and so that's sort of been a little exciting. Um, I'm the director of the Pacific Institute in Oakland, California. We're a nonprofit research and policy group working on creating and advancing solutions to the world's pressing water problems in the biggest sense. Uh, we do a book every two years called The World's Water on Global Water Issues. Uh, we did a book a couple of couple of years ago on um, a 21st century U.S. water policy, which I'll be drawing on a little bit today that Oxford University uh, produced. Uh, I'm a scientist by training, hydrology and climatology. I realize this is a water policy panel, but that's what the Institute does. We merge science and policy, uh, and water, as we heard this morning already in, in some very interesting comments. So, so from water deficit to water surplus, uh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Actually, you could leave all. Yeah, we could so, leave it all. <laughs> um, uh, you can't address this only with science. You have to address it with policy. The water is a complicated issue. Um, we work on uh, the corporate sector at the Pacific Institute as well. We are the science secretariat for something called the UN CEO Water Mandate, which is the part of the UN that's bringing the corporate sector together on water stewardship. Um, there's the Global Compact, which is the broad effort to bring the corporate sector together on sustainability issues, and the CEO Water Mandate, which is the water piece of that, and we work very closely with many of you in the room on that component of this. Um, I'm going to stop there. I think we have, we have plenty to talk about, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all for your introductions. You know, um, Ali... Oh, there you are. One of the things we heard at, your, at the White House Water Summit, by the way, thank you for organizing, it was outstanding, is that so many of these water issues we're facing, and I guess, Lynn, you, you brought this up in the context of asking for a glass of water, are local and regional. And yet, policies are often made at the national level. So, I want to start with the national level. And, um, I, Peter, I think I'm going to start with you, because I've heard you testify on this topic, but... What needs to be done from a national policy standpoint to address these challenges? Okay, thank you. So water is local, mostly. Um, the, the kinds of pricing issues we heard about, the, the regionalization of small-scale water systems we've heard about, state agencies, local agencies, water really is local. But having said that, there are fundamental things that the U.S. needs to do at the federal level. And I don't normally like to list things but I'm going to, just to get the conversation going, so pardon me. It, it worked well for Rick Perry, Peter. <laughs> what a sad comparison. <laughs> I, I will try and do better than that. Um, I, I have 11 things. I'll go through them really fast. Um, okay. One, uh, we have to combine and streamline federal agencies. There are a zillion federal agencies dealing with different aspects of water. There should not be a Department of Water. I'm not suggesting that. But we need to do a better job at the federal level of integrating the activities of the federal agencies that deal with water. 
Two, we need to revive river basin commissions and states that share rivers, which is almost every state, in one form or another, need to work together to manage those river basins across state boundaries. We need, third, a National Water Commission that advises the President and Congress on these issues. There has not been a National Water Commission in the United States since, I think, 1970, and the world's a little bit different today. Fourth, we have to improve data. Uh, the state of water data, and this was mentioned earlier, some of these things have been mentioned earlier, is sad, and sad is a polite term for it. Uh, we don't collect water data on water use. Uh, the water data that is collected isn't available. It's in paper form or it's in databases that are not easily accessible. There needs to be a fundamental revolution, and there ought to be given technology today, in the way we collect and distribute and manage and use water data. And that's from the national level to the personal level. We talked about water utility bills. Fifth, we have to be, use a better job of, we have to do a better job of using economic tools. And this was raised as well. Uh, water pricing structures at the local level, but the way the federal government deals with water and the water that it distributes through federally paid for water systems is a, an important part of this. We have to fund the state revolving loan fund fully. In fact, it ought to be hugely increased in cost, and we could talk about that later, maybe in the context of the Flint disaster. Sixth, we have to integrate climate change into every aspect of water planning, management, and use. Because again, as some people have already mentioned, climate is water. And as we change the climate, which we're doing, we're fundamentally altering water availability and quality and distribution and demand. Seventh, we have to update federal water laws. The Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act are great laws, and they're greatly out of date, and Congress needs to do that, and they're abdicating their responsibility in this as other things. Uh, eighth, demand management and alternative supply are keys to this. Uh, we focused in the past on supply traditional supply and reservoirs, and Manu showed the graph for US reservoirs. But there's an enormous amount that we need to do and have to do and partly are doing on demand management. And, and Mary Ann will talk a lot about this, I imagine. But alternative supply is key also. The idea of, of treated wastewater is critical. And I would disagree a little bit with Ali. Ali made the comment about desalination. Desalination is alternative supply. It's pretty low on my list, but there are a lot of other things we ought to be doing on wastewater treatment and reuse. Um, ninth, let's integrate U.S. water policy with other U.S. policy, energy policy, land use policy, uh, national security policy. Uh, and again, we talked a little bit earlier about energy, but there, there are a lot of things that we do at the federal level that are not explicitly water, but that really are and that we don't integrate. Um, tenth, Corporate water stewardship. The corporate sector has a huge role to play here, and maybe we can come back to this as well. Uh, I know, John, you're interested in this, and many others are. Uh, it's a key, key part of the future of water, is figuring out how to move towards sustainability in the corporate sector. And finally, um, environmental justice. We have failed grossly in this country at integrating environmental justice issues into water. And Flint is a good example. The report that was waved around this morning, that thick report on Flint, which came out yesterday, which I read part of, concluded that, that one of the most fundamental failures of Flint was an environmental justice failure. Uh, uh, there are um, issues about funding about water cutoffs that was, that was raised this morning. Uh, the EPA has a standard for how much a family ought to be willing to spend or able to spend on water bills. It's one and a half percent of your water bill. And there are millions of people probably that pay more than that. Um, there's tribal management issues in the western US that are unresolved. There's sensitive populations to certain kinds of pollutants that have not been addressed. So, so it's a list, but it, it gives you some sense of the broad nature of these things and the appropriate federal roles that, that we can bring. You know, thank you, Peter. You, you talked about um, economic tools, and I think you're talking mainly about federal funding for local and regional infrastructure, but I'm curious about the price of water. And this is a question for anyone on the panel, but Christine Boyle, one of the things you mentioned uh, during the earlier panel was there are 52,000 water utilities. You know, 
I'm, I'm, I'm betting most of them set their own water tariffs. And uh, Michael Dean, the National Association of Water Companies, this is something you guys know better than anyone. My question is, if water tariffs are too low, is there something that could be done to change that? Because that, to me, seems the baseline for a lot of the challenges in underinvestment, resulting in underinvestment infrastructure. Lynn, you want to? Well, I'm, I'm going to answer this a slightly sideways way, but certainly we do need full cost pricing around water, in, in, but done in a way that that um, uh, allows for baseline use for people that have the most challenges in paying. Peter's that social water. justice yeah. point. Yeah, but you know, yeah. in some ways, social justice is a lot about sh um, somebody else paying the cost for somebody else's action. And I think that that plays out in lots of ways, certainly in the Flint kind of way, but also uh, with water utilities throughout the country that are um, having to handle agricultural runoff. And then s s communities small and large uh, have to then pay for that agricultural runoff, both in terms of just quality of life of the waters that, that flow through their communities, but in very direct costs for having to treat that water to make it potable. Uh, to Lido with its um, the cyanobacteria coming from algae growth from from uh, so w from from uh, agricultural runoff and of course Des Moines are the two places that we we've heard a lot about but this is true throughout the country and especially in a lot of these small communities poor rural communities um, that are uh, don't have the money to to pay for that that cleaning so I think this gets back to agricultural policies in terms of how we can, it's not just putting less fertilizer on the field, we have a major opportunity for driving agricultural policies that improve soil health, that allow us to not only hold on to those nutrients, um, use less of them, irrigate less because the, the soil will hold more water, reduce flooding, and on and on and on. But I think that's one of the ways that we shift the cost and shift the action back upstream to uh, to the people that can control it so that those downstream and those with wells in those communities don't aren't paying the price for something that they didn't do. So as we look at at how we find equitable ways of of paying for for water, we certainly are, we're going to. Everybody's talking about how r rates are going to go up. That's just plain and simple. We have to do that. But we also have to look more broadly at ways for people to share that responsibility for keeping the water clean in the first place. Marion, does the Alliance for Water Efficiency do they think about uh, water tariffs or economics as something that would promote more efficiency just naturally? Actually, we, we do think about it quite a bit because as revenues are going down for water utilities that are implementing conservation programs, that hit to their revenue stream is very significant, as Christine mentioned earlier today. Um, so we developed at the Alliance a rate model that helps utilities goal seek for equalizing their revenue requirement with what the rate revenue is that they need to collect and giving them options for how to restructure their rates to do that. And while it sounds like it might result in very large rate increases, you know, I might point out that the average rate increase for the average consumer in the United States is usually the equivalent of a hot dog and a Coke on a monthly basis. In terms of absolute dollar values, it's usually not very much. But in cases where it is going to be high, this is where we need to look at the whole subject of investment and how that should work. Whether that should, oh, there you go, thank you. Whether the investment should uh, be assisted by federal and state um, supplements. Uh, but I think the most important thing I want to say about the whole rate and water conservation issue is that utilities now don't debt finance any water efficiency programs. And it's for a simple accounting reason. They don't have an asset that they can put on the balance sheet that matches the liability of the debt. So while we used to debt finance conservation in the 90s, we don't do it anymore because of this accounting problem. And so it actually exacerbates the issues of revenue collection by the utility. They have to pay for all the efficiency programs up front out of operating funds. Then they take the hit on demand reductions. All of that is right at the beginning of the benefit cycle of efficiency. And when the benefit kicks in in terms of reduced rate costs to the customer, it's five or six or seven years later well beyond the election timetable of the local official who had to approve the rate increase. So we have a political problem with respect to uh, rate 
increases. We have a financial accounting problem with respect to that, and we need to solve those barriers in addition to uh, equalizing the impact on um, environmental justice communities. Thanks, Marianne. Peter, I know you want to comment on, on that, and Brett, then, then we're going to come to you because I want to hear if there's a communications angle to all of this as well. Yeah, just two important points. One is we can come up, as Marianne has suggested, we can come up with rate designs that meet multiple objectives, that, that are equitable, that cover fixed costs, that give utilities the ability to, to, uh, to develop reserves so that they can get through periods of time when, rate, when revenues drop during droughts. We, we did this in the energy world. We, we disaggregated the uh, ability of energy utilities to invest in conservation and efficiency. It's a good example of cross-sectoral learning. Uh, well, let's do for the water sector what we did for energy and, and figure out how to invest in conservation and efficiency, which is often the cheapest source of water we have. Right, and I actually think that notion of learning from the, water, from the energy sector and applying the water sector was the basis for much of the White House Water Summit on Tuesday, Peter. Brett, did you want to comment? Yeah, just about uh, how we talk about these things. The initial question was uh, individual water bills and affordability. And we very quickly got into a discussion of agricultural runoff and farm policy. Uh, so that shows the big leap between one item that we talk about and, and the other, and the disconnect we have in a lot of uh, the conversations we have about these topics. <coughs> Utility uh, officials are not all that involved in setting agricultural farm regulations, but if you want to address the affordability issue, that's one of the things that will have to come into the picture. And then we also leapt from uh, ag runoff into financing mechanisms. So it's a big picture. And when we talk about affordability issues and infrastructure, we're often talking just about aging infrastructure. And that's the headline on most stories you read. US aging infrastructure is failing. But to really address this, it's a much bigger conversation. And as everyone has addressed, it's multiple sectors, multiple players at the table that will need to talk about this. You know. Um Peter, I, I just want to come back to one, one of the items in your list of 11. You, you mentioned a National Water Commission. I just want to know, what would the jurisdiction of a National Water Commission be? How would it fit with what Congress does or EPA does or the Department of Interior does? And also, how would states feel about that? Because any anytime the words national and water are, are said in the same sentence, I think states get very nervous. <laughs> okay. so. I, I don't believe that a National Water Commission would solve our water problems. I do believe there has been a failure at the federal level for 50 years to discuss the appropriate role of the federal government in dealing with water problems. A and I see a National Water Commission as, as an advisory w way of dealing with what the federal government ought to do to help the states and local agencies do what we need to do better, which is provide safe, affordable, reliable water systems. Um, and part of it, of course, could be very explicitly, here are the things we're not going to talk about at the federal level because they're state and local responsibilities. Th that's, there's always a tension there. but. But that's, I, I'm not too worried about that. And Marianne, is there any, does the Alliance for Water Efficiency think about ways to promote greater recycling and reuse? I am so glad you asked that question. <laughs> it's my um, job. We, we have been doing a lot of thinking about why on-site reuse doesn't seem to be taking hold in this country. Um, California has had a gray water standard uh, legislative, uh, enabling legislation in place for 20 years or more. But there aren't large scale gray water installations in uh, California, Mo mostly because local public health officers are reluctant to give approvals because they're not sure what the underlying treatment standards ought to be. And if you're talking about black water treatment systems, package treatment systems that could completely recycle all water use on site, like the Living Machine does at the San Francisco Public Utilities Headquarters building, um, those are always permitted on a pilot basis and not really um, able to be replicated on a major scale across the country. Largely it's because we lack the national guidance for adequate treatment standards to enable this technology which is available, which is being sold 
by GE and others all around the world, but not here. We really would like to see better deployment of that technology and better use of it so that we don't have to expand existing wastewater systems where it's cost, more cost effective to do the on-site option. So we have to deal with the national barrier uh, policy issues. There has to be guidance coming from EPA. There has to be guidance that local public health officers can rely on when they give permits that they don't think later they'll be sued for. So that's something that could be on the list for the National Water Commission to look at. That would be very useful um, uh, national contribution. Lynn? Yeah, and sort of right up there with it is um, rainwater harvest as water supply, which is, of course, a lot easier to clean than, than sewage is. Um, very few places are looking that at, at looking at that for potable water supply. Uh, health commissioners still get a little wigged out about that, but there are there is work going on to try to figure out those policies and figure out how that can work in a more sensible way. The white paper that um, the Columbia Water Center has put, put out leading up to this talks a bit about distributed <laughs> water, um, how we can um, come up with other ways that use less energy, have a lower infrastructure burden to maintain as we look to the, the decades and century ahead of us. And I think that rainwater harvest for, is, is, um, is going to be a critical piece of that. Thanks, Lynn. Brett, you know, it seems to me that water reuse or greater treatment of, of wastewater so they can be reused for things like, you know, agriculture, industry, even drinking water is one of the keys to the kingdom in addressing the water scarcity challenge we're facing. Is there a communications angle here? A lot of times you hear one of the main barriers to more reuse is reluctance on the part of communities to, to use treated wastewater for those purposes. Yeah, initially there was uh, an image problem with the reuse of wastewater. Uh, don't don't campaign. do it. <laughs> Should I say the phrase? Don't, don't. Okay. Don't. I might have to say the phrase. No. <laughs> the, the phrase that Peter does not want me to say, but I have to say so that everyone knows what we're talking about, is toilet to tap. Uh, and that's how wastewater was branded for so long. And it's a terrible reputation. It got people... Uh, with the wrong images associated with the wastewater. So the industry has moved away from that, uh, as the vehemence on the panel here shows. Uh, but people are coming around to it. It comes back to having utility that's able to talk about this stuff with their customers and having a presence in the community. Uh, so people in San Diego have come around to the idea of water reuse after four years, uh, objecting to it. And so it's on the utility. and. A lot of utilities are starting to do better with their communications. So through Twitter or Facebook or community outreach, having mascots. So there's water drops that, you know, big furry things that go out to community events and <laughs> talk to the kids. Uh, yeah, so it's just you know, getting out there in front of the people, being honest about what's happening, and the, you know, people will come around. So more education and outreach. Peter, did you want to comment? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, it's time to stop calling them wastewater treatment plants. It's time to start calling them water recovery plants or some, something better. I'm sure somebody could come up with something Resource better. Resource recovery. A euphemism. That's good. I like that. So, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about national policies, um, and yet, as we said uh, at the outset, a lot of the challenges we face are at the local and regional level. Is there, should we be trying to engage members of Congress at the local and regional level? Because they're the ones, for example, uh, Dan Kildee, Congressman Dan Kildee, who, who lives in Flint, Michigan, is somebody who now, I'm sure, cares acutely about water <laughs> policy issues. Is that something that should be done, reaching out locally, regionally, to members of Congress? Marianne. Okay, I'm going to take the opportunity to answer this question to do my policy barrier uh, issue. Answer it close to the mic. Okay, this is a little better, I hope. Okay. Thanks. So my big issue, my big policy issue, is we need a national commitment to water and, and efficient water, sustainable water use, as we have a national commitment to energy efficiency and efficient and sustainable energy use. They are the same. And they're connected in such a way that the investments and the policy emphasis should be the same on both sides. And so this is an issue that Congress needs to look at. It, it's well beyond a local congressional district. It's, it's something that is regional, state, and national in focus. And I have, uh, I want to quote Ali here because I think at one of the, the December 15th meeting, you, you talked about a moonshot for water. Uh, like the Sunshot Initiative. And I was really taken with that because I, I really think that's what we need. And um, I took a look at some of the investments that have been made both in the uh, uh, 
private sector as well as in the federal side. Um, Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment did a paper in 2014 where they looked at 13 years of investment in the U.S. 69 billion was invested in U.S. in clean energy, but only 1.5 billion in water. That's on the mm -hmm. private side. Federal spending is even worse. Federal spending in energy is substantial. It's, a, it's at least 290 billion a year, depends on how you calculate it. But and but with energy incentives, about 47 billion. But you don't have a similar investment on the federal side in water. The SRFs or state revolving funds are dwindling in size, and you don't have any really efficiency incentives like you have in energy. In fact. Efficiency rebates and green infrastructure rebates in the United States are federally taxed. So not only do we not have a tax exempt or a tax credit, uh, we tax personal individuals for doing the right thing and investing in water efficiency on their properties. So we, we have to fix this. Um, and I thought the opportunity was the stimulus bill um, because $787 billion, that should have been a big slice going to water issues. And 630 some billion went to energy and climate related issues, only 12 billion to water, only 20% of that went to efficiency and green infrastructure um, topics. So there's a huge disparity in investment. Um, and so that results also in a huge disparity in, in policy. Uh, the SRFs have been dwindling over time. The clean water SRF, in, in over a 30-year period is probably invested uh, over $100 billion, but that's over 30 years. That's nothing in terms of an energy investment. And so we're talking about the health of our existing infrastructure in addition to expansions to accommodate growing populations and new sustainable water uses. We have got to figure out a better way to manage this money so that it's funneled to the right places <laughs> and we're solving some of our water issues. Um, so. Parity, that's what I'm always harping on when, when I get the microphone. Uh, I want parity with energy. I've got energy efficiency envy. I'd like to see water efficiency and sustainable water uses have the same federal investment level and same federal policy attention. Lynn? Yeah, I think one of the things, we certainly do need federal attention on this. And, and these days, you know, post Flint, I think we've got the attention of members of Congress who represent urban areas, especially some of the more down and out urban areas. So, so I, I think there's a, a people are, are lined up to add money to the pot in those areas, I think. My concern is that it will be a knee jerk reaction to just send more money to kind of build what we've already got to, to, uh, to, to well, to, certainly Flint has already received it's, yeah. it's badly needed and much deserved money. But um, uh, if we just increase the SRF, or we just hand out federal grants, that doesn't really get us to this the solutions that we need to be able to be resilient for the decades to come. And, um, and I think we also need to be looking to other bills, not just to money that goes specifically to the water sector, you know, transportation fuels with ethanol, the water that goes into ethanol uh, is a hu has huge impact on our water system overall. Investments in renewable energy, you know, water um, uh, water sipping renewable energies such as solar and wind have huge impacts on our water resources. So I think we also need to open our minds to what are those other slices of federal policy and funding that have big impact on water. Yeah, Peter. I agree with that completely. And one, one more example is the Farm Bill. Uh, the Farm Bill over the years has had a little bit of money for uh, farmers to improve the water efficiency of irrigation systems. And uh, that money has disappeared immediately. I mean, the demand for that money has been enormous. And the, de the demand reflects the need nationwide to figure out how to grow more food with less water. And that's this efficiency argument. It's this demand management argument. 80% of the water that's consumed, consumed in the US goes to the agricultural sector. And we haven't talked much about it, uh, but it's, it's pretty critical. And we could grow a lot more food with a lot less water, but we're not funding farmers who need help to, to do that. Thanks, Peter. And I, I guess one of the ironies in California is even though there were 25% uh, uh, water reduction mandates for communities, agriculture continued to pump a great deal of groundwater. Uh, 
And I think uh, there was somebody at the White House who said solving today's problem at the expense of tomorrow. You know, so that there has to be some holistic way to think about this. Um, look, we've been talking a lot about the U.S. Let's move beyond the U.S. borders. And are there <coughs> lessons we can learn from around the world? And I'm just reminded of uh, a few years ago when I was in Australia meeting with a senior government official and asked, how do you, they, they were implementing a direct potable water reuse program. And I asked, how do you get people comfortable with this? That's what we're trying to figure out in the U.S. And he said, we've engaged uh, universities, uh, uh, we, we, we have research papers, we have stakeholder meetings and communication <clears throat> strategies. And what we found is that it works best when we don't say anything at all. <laughs> and are there other lessons, perhaps better lessons, that we can learn from what others are doing around the world? And Brett, I want to start with you. Have you seen anything from a communication standpoint? Or maybe you guys are leading, leading the effort around the world. Yeah, so these challenges are not unique to the U.S. Um, we've seen it in work in India and China, Australia and Mexico, uh, that water, food and energy are all tied together around the world. Uh, initially, it's the information. So we have to bring to people who are making decisions uh, good information. And so data collection is essential. That's what Australia did before it could embark on its uh, changes to the water policies. It had to know how much water was available in the Murray-Darling Basin after its big drought. Uh, how much should be allocated to the environment and how they're going to do that. Uh, so I think the, the big lesson from most of these areas, and uh, Peter and others can talk about some of the policy changes that came out of that and in other areas, but you have to know what you have before you can do much about it. And that's where you know, a lot of the U.S. is still at that knowing what we have phase. Thanks, Marianne. Um, we, we do have a lot we can learn from other countries. Uh, Australia has been mentioned. Um, in fact, uh, Peter, Peter's colleagues at, with, at the Pacific Institute worked with us at the Alliance for Water Efficiency and the Institute for Sustainable Futures in Sydney, and we published a report that was released a couple of weeks ago uh, on the Australia experience with their millennium drought and what the lessons are that could be applied to California uh, from that experience. So. What, what Australia did in terms of changes to its policies and the investments that it made, both good and bad, uh, can be used as instructive examples for uh, other climate-ridden areas. Um, Israel, of course, is a, is a huge model for us. And uh, Seth Siegel recently published his book, Let There Be Water. But we've been following what Israel's been doing for a long time. In fact, we're going to hold a conference in Tel Aviv in 2017 to showcase a lot of uh, Israel's work. Uh, they 80% of their water use is recycled. I mean, they, they already are doing a lot of what we're talking about here. And they have made a sizable, and uh, not only national investment, but a national priority. Um, I was at a conference once where um, uh, the Prime Minister said, we want to be the leading water uh, technology nation in the world. And, and that was a huge commitment coming right from the top. And it made me think about, uh, in the United States, do we ever really talk about water on a national platform? Um, I don't think we've had water as a discussion in a presidential uh, campaign since 1936, since the Dust Bowl years. We don't talk about water. It's largely an invisible issue. And that's probably the one silver lining in this horrible tragedy in Flint, is it's, it's going to daylight those issues now, and we're going to hopefully start talking about it in a national dialogue, really for the first time. You know, that, that's a good point, Marianne. But, and I, I will just say that, uh, and you were there, but I think uh, Tuesday's White House Water Summit was a great step in that huge, direction. Huge, huge step, yeah. Lind I just, you know, a lot of times um, work that's being developed here in the U.S., but but we can't find a place to to try it out here goes to other countries, and we can bring it back. And I think of right here at Columbia, Kardik Chandran, who has um, uh, was a MacArthur Fellow this year for his work in developing technologies for um, uh, distributed sanitation and resource recovery. That, but for the most part, is being piloted in other countries. And we could definitely use it right here, especially in some of the, the rural and, and poorer areas of, of this, of our, of our, uh, of our na nation. So, so sometimes it's, you know, the brains are right here. We just don't have the economic drivers or the political will or whatever to use it here. That's a great uh, point, Lynn. And Peter, do you, do you want to make a comment before we open it up to the audience? Yeah, just um, back to this question about lessons from other places. Uh, a number of great examples have, have been given. Um, one of the major lessons from Australia was nine years of drought 
really concentrates the mind. Uh, uh, they, you know, California's now, I, I've argued in our fifth year of drought, it's, we didn't get a rainy winter as rainy as we would have liked. Um, it took Australia nine years to do some of the fundamental things that we've still not done in California. And so crisis is a bit of a motivator. Um, education is really important. Uh, Singapore, which has been highlighted in a number of places because of their technology, their water reuse, their desalination, in my opinion, is an, is an example of education and communications. They've done a tremendous job of educating their population about water, uh, uh, the need to use it more efficiently, the water quality advantages of recycling and reuse. So, so education is a piece of that. Law is a piece of this. South Africa, uh, when they got rid of apartheid, they had the opportunity to rewrite their water laws, their, all of their laws. And when they rewrote their constitution, they put in their constitution a human right to water before the UN declared a human right to water. And they also wrote into their constitution an ecosystem right to water, which, which was a legal precedent, in my opinion. So there are lots of international examples, and you know no, nobody's doing it all right, I would argue, but the, the lessons that we can learn from looking at other places are, are sometimes incredibly important. Thanks, Peter. Manu, do we have questions <coughs> from the audience? Few questions from the audience. It's on. Is the sound okay? Great. Uh, so, um, multiple audience members uh, inquired about uh, water in the agricultural sector. So, how can we incentivize water conservation, soil health, and runoff reduction in ag? And what are possible policy options? Lynn? Well, you know, sometimes I think we have to get out of the way because if you, you know, the, the, there are some w um, fairly well publicized examples of, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever seen the, the little video Soil Carbon Cowboys, um, where there's a great line in there. It's, it's working with ranchers who have been um, trying out uh, uh, multi-species cover crops as a way to um, feed their their cattle that they're raising, and there's this and they're they're regular old ranchers. There's nothing fancy about these guys, and they are all guys. And one of them said, and pardon me if this is offensive to anybody, one of them said, if I had known about this years ago, I'd have 12 kids by now because I have so much time on my hands um, because it's so much easier and cheaper to do it that way. And you hear similar things from um, commodity crop growers who uh, uh, trying new ways really in some ways old ways of you know multi-species cover crops that really enrich the soil and help give them resilience to drought reduce their overhead reduce their capital costs it it can be self-driving but right now are all the policies that come out from the, um, the Department of Agriculture and from uh, those that advise farmers are uh, going in different a different direction so how we kind of can stop that and there's you know there's a lot of money in the way that you know money um, is a pretty hard thing to push against I'm, and I'm speaking of um, those interests that that are making money off of fertilizers and herbicides and irrigation equipment and all that sort of thing Peter I, I know you want to comment yeah, so that's a great question, and it's a tough one, and we don't talk about agriculture enough. But this is a good example where the federal government has a role to play, and already plays a role. Uh, they, they built and operated the Central Valley Project in California, and the prices for water from that project don't pay even the cost of repaying the, the capital cost of that project. So farmers pay less for CVP water than they pay for state water, and those farmers are less likely to be growing water-efficient crops in a water-efficient manner. So pricing at the federal level is important. Subsidies for crops drive choices that farmers make in terms of what they plant, as do crop prices internationally. The Farm Bill example that I mentioned is a way to help farmers do make improvements that they want to make but can't afford to make. Energy policy was also raised. I think Lynn, Lynn raised it. The, the idea that we subsidize ethanol in, in order to well, don't get, me don't get me into the Iowa caucus debate. But, <laughs> but that has a water 
that has a huge water implication. Uh, and those are all just quick examples of things that the federal government does play an important role in that could fundamentally change how we use water and how much we use in the agricultural sector. Great. Thanks. Anybody else want to comment or next question? OK. So the next question is that given that crisis is a motivator, what can be done now to capitalize on public attention regarding water uh, quantity in California and water quality in Flint? Yeah, yeah, Brett, do you, do you want to start with that? Yeah. Uh, crisis is a motivator, but we have to be careful not to over sell the, the danger. I mean, crisis eventually can become off-putting when people read uh, about crisis all the time. You eventually tune out. Uh, but I think there's a huge opportunity with people's attention. Uh, people are reading more than ever. We have smart devices. We have <coughs> access to information at our fingertips almost every hour of the day. Uh, so the ability for people to see something that's important uh, has never been greater. So the importance there is making sure that the information is understandable, like taking this white paper that has been circulated is a comprehensive look at America's water problems. Uh, but it's 30 different directions, and the human mind can only handle so much. Uh, so taking that crisis and breaking it down into pieces that are understandable, but also show connections between all of these concepts uh, is something I think will start to move some action. Marianne? We have largely made our water infrastructure invisible, not just because it's buried beneath the ground, but because we have spent 30 or 40 years just not really talking to the customer about what it is that they're drinking. And part of that was deliberate. You know, the drinking water industry is very proud of its record and, and that what it was providing to its citizens. Um, and it didn't want the consumer to worry. You know, most managers didn't want to fill up boardrooms with, uh, you know, citizens who would oversee what, what was going on. In fact, when I was chair of a water board, my general manager told me to stop trying to invite people to the board meetings. He just wanted to be white noise in the background. <laughs> And that only works when times are good. When suddenly a crisis happens like in Flint and the consumer has no concept of anything about that system and what its needs were or, or the fact that the, the money raid from the municipal coffers was costing the ability to do infrastructure repair and replacement, that citizen is not in a position to comment meaningfully. And so what we need to do is, is, is really what Brent was saying. We need to do a lot of baseline education and discussion so that when the crisis hits, those citizens can be informed participants in the change. And that's, I think, the biggest problem we've got right now. There are a lot of angry people. They're still not well informed, but they're angry. And that's the problem with uh, crisis management. But that's how we make policy. That's how we move mountains in government. And um, so recognizing the opportunity that the crisis presents and the cre creative opportunity it can present is what we need to, to take advantage of. Yeah, you know, one of the, the things that there's a lot of um, very low level uh, conversation happening about right now it has to do with the social institutions that push back and that, that are watchdogs on water. For ever since the Clean Water Act, we've had, um, you know, the Clean Water Act has a provision that for citizen suits, the citizens have standing to protect and enforce those Clean Water Act laws. And as a result, we have um, a whole in cottage industry of citizen groups that can and will push back on, we won't call them the wastewater treatment um, world, but the, the resource recovery facilities, that's what we're, the word, the term that the industry is using nowadays, um, when, when um, they feel that, that the Clean Water Act is being violated. And, and it's not fun for the industry to get that kind of pushback, but that's what keeps, that's what has moved us along and has kept um, the process honest and transparent. The, um, on the drinking water side, we do not have those social institutions in place, which is, you know, it, it took uh, citizens in Flint to kind of keep pushing and pushing and pushing, but these are people who were, these were individuals, these were not organizations. And we're, um, so in the NGO world and in the community organizing world right now, there's a lot of um, kind of, uh, what do we do? You know, the existing water groups 
they haven't really put their head around drinking water. They've sort of ignored it because it's been so so safe. And we're realizing, gosh, how do we how do we um, incorporate that into the work that we do? So I think there's going to there will be there needs to be and there will be a shift in our institutions. And one of the really um, I think exciting pieces of that is I think this will be, I'm a very hopeful person, this will be what finally gets us to uh, take water out of the fleece wearing and uh, canoe paddling and viral world in which I live into a much more integrated um, uh, conversation that represents America as a whole. And I think that's a pretty exciting opportunity. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, Pick so, a good one. Um, so considering uh, that states hold the responsibility to implement national policy at the local level, how can we overcome the disparity between states that do this well versus those who are not doing so well? Citizen advocates. <laughs> That's good. Um, anybody else want to take a crack at this? Kind of in a 30 second, 30 to 60 second answer? Well, I was going to say the vote, which is yeah. the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was talking to somebody, uh, um, I, I was doing a project around uh, lead and water and who's doing innovative things and what should be invested in and stuff. And um, when I called Scott Bryan, some of you might know Scott Bryan from Imagine H2O, and his, his gig is innovation and, and, and startup technology. But the, you know what he said first off in terms of where the investment needs to be? He said democracy. He said every, every foundation should be giving 5% of their, at least 5% of their granting to democracy. That's what's going to keep our water safe. Peter? So to elaborate just a little, um, again, there is a federal role in oversight. Uh, this came up in Flint, too. EPA has an oversight role that maybe they didn't play as well as they should have. Um, we have federal law. We don't have 50 state water quality laws. We have, we have federal water quality laws because we don't want there to be disparities to different communities because some states might be weaker than others uh, in, in developing those standards. And so there is, again, a federal role in, I would argue, updating the Safe Drinking Water Act and expanding hugely the numbers and types of chemicals that are regulated in our drinking water, and then helping the states meet their, their responsibilities in meeting those standards. Okay, I think what I'm gonna do is ask each of you if you have any final thought you would like to share, kind of 10, 20 seconds um, with the audience, and then I'll just make a wrapping up comment. Brett? Sure. I'd like to talk about the, the language we use to talk about these problems. Uh, so in meetings like this and a lot of the discussions we have, it's a very technical language that makes the eyes glaze over after a little bit. So aging infrastructure and silos and mitigation and all of these words that we use all the time to talk about are what we try to avoid when we're telling stories about what's going on with America's water. I think the biggest role that the journalism side has is in the translation and being able to take what happens in these discussions and show its effect on human lives and to write that in a way that gets people's attention. Translate complex issues into plain language and communicate it effectively. Terrific. Marianne? Um, I'm going to take my last opportunity here to indicate one more policy that I'd like to see, and that is that plays off of what Christine said earlier. We leak so much water in this country, there's no excuse for not making it a requirement that water systems that are applying for federal money uh, need to demonstrate adequate water loss control programs. And um, that's just something we could do, easily do. Reduce lost water. Reduce leakage, yeah. <clears throat> Lynn? Well, I'll just kind of reiterate um, something that uh, it, we see in the, the, the white paper that, um, that Columbia Water Center has produced and I think is so important. We've got a lot of changes and challenges ahead, but as we address them, I think it's really important that we do so in the context of climate change and social equity. And we have a, a great opportunity ahead of us to do that. Um, let's, not, let's not solve today's problems with yesterday's technologies. We've got new opportunities ahead. The backdrop is climate change and social equity. And Peter? 
So I agree with I agree with that. And one of the ways I like to describe this problem is we have 19th century infrastructure and 20th century institutions and 21st century problems, water problems. And we need to build and develop the 21st century infrastructure and institutions to deal with the 20th century problems that we failed to solve in the 21st, the new problems that we're adding on, like climate change. Take a new approach. And so, look, I just want to wrap up by saying, Manu, thank you very much for hosting this event. It's a great honor to be here. Thank each of you. I learn from you every time I, I see you. Brett, first time we met, but I learned from you as well. <laughs> and I just want to say, Ali, thanks for kicking off the week, organizing a great uh, World Water Week, organizing a great White House Water Summit. Manu, so glad that you're launching this roadmap process, and we'll look, we'll look with interest at, for, the, for the results. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, John and the panelists. Uh, I believe we are, not, we are not glazed over on the other side, despite what your view from here might look like. Also, <laughs> I, I thought Peter was going to close by saying that we also have some people in the country who want to be in the 17th century now, so <laughs> <laughs> part of the mix. But uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, we have one or two more things, depending on how we do this, before we close out. And the next thing is I'm going to request Gretchen McLean, who's a good friend and a fantastic person. She has a history going from engineering to NASA to becoming a CEO of the first pure water company that Alcho introduced. And um, I would like her to see if she wants to offer some closing thoughts. And then Bill Becker has a three minute water reuse video, which you can drink. Huh. Great. So, Gretchen. <coughs> That's going to be tough to, to sum up everything we just heard this morning. But um, <laughs> just the other evening, Wednesday night, I went and had dinner with Manu. And Manu and I go back quite a few years. Actually, he was a professor of mine at the University of Utah. And I think he actually might have been younger than me at the time. But um, so we have a history. And, and as um, we started Xylem as a water company, we put together an advisory board to help us think <laughs> outside of our traditional thinking around the products that we were bringing to the market and think about you know, going into emerging markets, thinking about how the utilities were playing. Michael Dean was part of that um, board. We were looking at trying to challenge kind of our thinking rather than the traditional way of bringing products for profit for a business. And, and where could we be innovative that ultimately may keep us still in the high end of the market, but also think about innovation for the lower end and thinking about the systems integration that's absolutely required. Um, so let me try and sum up a little bit of what I heard and, and then uh, try and kind of push for that call of action that I think is, is essential. Um, Menu started out with a number of issues. And then we had the panels also elaborate a little bit more on the issues that are at hand. No question, this industry is very fragmented and is very difficult to work with the way it is today. But think about it. Let's go back in a lot of history compared to what got us to where we are. And especially I'm going to talk specifically the Americas because that's what we're talking about here. Is we had an environment that was growing. We were expanding across the US. We were putting our water systems in as we were growing and so forth. And we put governing bodies in at the time to address those multiple bodies that we needed just to keep up with that pace of growth. Well, that growth has slowed down. That doesn't mean there aren't areas that will continue to grow and so forth, but we don't have necessarily now the way to think of our infrastructure and our delivery system in a different way, which is not in a growth environment. It means now thinking about it from a systems perspective. And it also means thinking about it in a perspective of what policies worked before aren't necessarily the policies that are going to take us to the future. In fact, some of them are actually going to take us steps back if we don't get them off the table and say, what are we not going to do? What are we still going to do? And then what needs to change to where we need to go? And we talked a little bit about that. Menu then ad addressed a lot of opportunities. And I think we can get really down on ourselves and saying, look at the water infrastructure, a D minus that John mentioned. Um, we talk about all the issues. But we've also made some progress. And I would argue that and it was stated several times by many people, that most of the technology that we need to address most of our issues is there. 
It's out there. Doesn't mean technology can't be advanced, there can't be more efficiency in several of the technologies we're talking about, but a lot of the technology is actually now integrating that technology and thinking about it from a system where we can apply it to solve the problems that we're doing. So well, we talk about um, technology and we talk about today, where every one of us use social media. We get on our, our, um, our, 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 our iPhones and we get data at our fingertips. There's no real good source to tell me or any of you in one place what's all the water technologies. You got to go through and you got to know a lot of people and eventually you find out maybe what worked in one situation. Part of it is because of the complexity. Every water issue is a local issue and you know, depending upon the pressure of the water, the quality of the water, what you're trying to do with that water means a different solution. But there is nowhere to really go to get that repository of information and data. We also know, and we talked a lot about solutions here, and Peter, I think you did a great job, but what are some of the things we need from a federal level? What are the next things that we need to do at the state level? And as you stated, what are we not going to do at the federal level so that can be done at the state level? What are we not going to do at the state level so that it can be done at that local um, issue? And we need to lay that out and put some real concrete definition behind it. We also heard from Ollie that the, the administration is now making this a priority. So let's hope that is the case and then you can and, and use that as an opportunity to really take this forward. We look at the countries that we've seen that do this very well. There is a mandate at the very top of the administration that says, I'm behind this, we're gonna make this happen, we're going to measure our progress, and we have a goal to get to an end state. We don't have that today, we need to drive that. And so I'll come to the challenge that I think Columbia Water has laid out and Manu is, is trying to drive, which is how do we build that 2030 roadmap? that national strategy that's going to get us there. And stop talking about it, but start laying out what that plan of action is and then starting to measure ourselves against that action plan and communicating not just the crisis, but the successes that we've had. You, we, can, we can point to a number of successes in different states, different local regions, even globally that have integrated some of the issues. But most people don't understand it. What they hear about is Flint, which they should hear about, but they hear about, and we start talking about water around those issues, or when we have an issue like Sandy, or we have an issue when you've got a drought in California. This needs to be a steady state. Water is so dependent. And we also can't live in a little world that we're water alone. Let's learn what the energy market did, but even more so important, because water is different than energy, <coughs> We need to have that nexus of food, water, energy, and think about it again from a larger systems perspective. Um, I'll just play a little bit on my background, um, engineer background. Um, wasn't in the water industry. I worked in the space program starting out. And I will tell you, during space program, at one point in time, we almost lost the build of the International Space Station program to one vote in Congress. And why did we almost lose it? We had our industry competing. Everyone wanted the biggest piece of the puzzle. No one wanted to share anything that was going on. Every international partner wanted a big piece of the puzzle. And it wasn't until we were faced with that crisis that said, how do we work together? And how do we all win for the industry and for really a, for the future in terms of exploring the, uh, the, uh, the unknown and bringing technology either whether it helps us here on Earth or it ultimately lets us you know, explore Earth even more, outside of the Earth more, did we come together and we started saying, okay, guess what? I'm not gonna get uh, the biggest piece of the puzzle, but we're gonna get some of it because the industry's gonna stay alive. We've seen the energy market move together where at first they pushed each other back and said, we don't wanna work with each other. We each want to be the big winner, and they found out they had to work together to make it happen. I'd say for us, and the call in this room is for how do we get together as the water industry and do it, and start laying out those actionable um, roadmap. And I think that is what Columbia wants to help us do. I think there are enormous um, knowledge base in this room and outside of this room that has most of those steps. Not everything's thought out, but have enough that says, here's obvious things we need to do, Here's the things we can't do, and then here's some of the things we gotta go work out, and let's go spend a lot of time really working it out, and then let's get these things approved and move on. I'm making it sound easy, but I think 
we got to stop talking the issues and we got to start putting a plan in place and putting it in front of those leaders, whether it's at the federal level or the state level, to say yes or no. If they say no, then we've got to go say what actions do we take to go address this. But we've got to address this really aggressively. It's right now in front of us. If we don't do it, we'll be here five more years from now talking about the same issues. And we'll be seeing the same players week after week. And to me, that's not really how we get, we get this thing resolved. So I'm going to close with that and say, Manu, you've got a lot of work on your shoulders, but let's not leave it up to him. It's all of us in this room. It's every level of the government. It's every level in terms of the water industry. And it's really those industries that we connect to that need our water or that we need to make sure they're not contaminating the water that we have that ultimately comes back to everyone. But technology's there, and it's a matter of putting those action plans in place and getting it done. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Gretchen. Very nicely done, as always. Uh, same for all you guys. You're amazing. Please start sending us emails saying, here is my great idea for solving the world's water problems starting in Flint, Michigan, or uh, Harlem, New York, or whatever. Thank you.